Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Making 2D Minecraft. If you are new to this series, I have taken on the massive task of programming a 2D version of Minecraft from the ground up in C++. And we have a very solid foundation so far, and in today's episode, we are going to be focusing on implementing gameplay, and take this mostly empty world and turn it into something that we can actually interact and play with. So sit back and enjoy this episode of Making 2D Minecraft. Alright, to kick off this episode, I want to get a feature out of the way that is very important in a game like Minecraft, and that is block placement. Implementing a feature like this requires some code to calculate what block is selected based on the current mouse position. And this should have been an easy task, but with zooming and everything else that happens to the camera, I ended up confusing myself instead, but I eventually got it working. In the debug menu, I can now use the mouse wheel to scroll through all of the blocks and place them down at will but I quickly noticed a problem. If I put down some blocks, move far away, and come back to the spot where I was, all of the blocks are gone. This is due to the fact that chunks get deleted when I move too far away, and are then regenerated when I come back. So it's time to implement something I've been putting off for a long time now, which is world saving. The reason I put this off was because writing file saving code is a very dull and time consuming task but I sucked it up and pushed myself through it. So now the code is done, and if I open up the game and place down some blocks, I can safely leave the game and come back in. And there are the blocks that I placed down. The worlds themselves are saved in individual folders with their names on them and the chunks get saved into a subdirectory and numbered depending on their distance from the origin. Then when the world is loaded, if a chunk is added to the world, it can either be freshly generated or loaded from a file. So the program checks if the chunk exists before it does anything. While I was implementing this, I had a bug where the chunks would be saved but wouldn't be loaded correctly, which led to the chunks just being completely missing, because the game knew the chunk files existed but they couldn't be loaded in correctly. Alright, up until now I've just been placing down the blocks using the debug menu. But let's actually get an item system up and working, so we can finally mine blocks, pick them up, and place them down, just like in Minecraft. To get started on this, I created a couple of classes to handle the item system, one of which is just called item, that actually represents the data of the item itself. And the other is called item entity, this will be the entity that is dropped on the ground once a block is mined. You could see here an early version of the item entity, and it collides with the ground correctly. But it has no texture currently, so I created a system where the items can use the block and wall texture atlases as a source for their textures, as well as a new texture atlas that we will get to in a bit. But the result of all of this is textured items, but I can't pick up any of them yet. So it's time to segue into the next thing that needs to be added, which is the inventory. To start off this task, I wanted to get the hotbar working. So I got some textures transferred over and began writing the code to load in everything and render the UI. To store the items, the player has an array that represents the inventory. Then whenever an item entity is near the player, it is then picked up by adding it to the inventory using this very confusing looking function. To test out our new system, I wrote some code to give me a dirt block every frame, and once it reaches its stack size, it moves on to the next inventory slot. When I was implementing the item dropping, for when you break blocks, I thought it would be fun to give each item entity a random velocity, but I set it a bit too high, resulting in this fiasco. Another issue I ran into was having problems deleting the item entities themselves once they were picked up resulting in the first of probably many duplication glitches. Now the inventory system doesn't just include the hotbar, so I turned my attention to the rest of the inventory. So after writing some more UI code, when you press E now, it opens up the inventory. But not just that, you can also move items around, split up stacks, and perform all kinds of other basic item operations that you were able to do in normal Minecraft. And if you haven't noticed it yet, I also decided to add the health, hunger, and XP bars to the UI while I was at it. Although they don't really do anything yet, but they will soon enough. 
Now, not all of the items in Minecraft are simply just blocks, as I alluded to earlier. I made a separate texture sheet for items that have their own unique textures, such as tools and ores. What's cool is that I could finally start giving special properties to certain items. So obviously blocks can be placed down, but the tools can be made to mine certain blocks faster. As a rather simple example, if I mine stone with my fist, nothing drops and it's a rather slow process. But with a pickaxe now, albeit a wooden one, the process is significantly faster, and an item drops. And it's cobblestone instead of stone. All of these properties are stored in a file when the game is loaded, which makes it easy to change things on the fly. Now the ores on the item texture atlas need some love too, so I think it's time we turn our attention back to the world and start adding some new things to it. The first of which being ore generation. This process was pretty straightforward. All that is required is putting the ore textures into the block texture atlas, which I already did in the last episode, and then creating some new generators to generate the ores. Since the underground is split into two main layers, being the stone layer and the deep slate layer, I made sure to only have the deep slate ores generate in the deep slate layer, so that way the blocks match up to each other correctly. So here is what the updated underground now looks like. You can see all kinds of ores scattered around, and once we reach the deep slate layer, the ores change blocks. The only problem right now is balancing the generation values so that some of the veins aren't too big, but I'll be adjusting them over time to get them to a place that I'm happy with. Now that's not the only thing I wanted to do to the world in this episode. I also wanted to add something important to the surface, which is a new biome. The biome I've decided to add is a taiga biome. Now the first part of this process was to create some new blocks, so I transferred some textures over to our block texture atlas and began writing out some new code for this biome. The problem with the taiga biome is that its trees, the spruce trees, are a lot more complex than what I've been working with so far being oak and birch trees. So I had to come up with a system to correctly generate the rings of the trees. And after creating a mess of multiple nested for loops and some upside down trees, we now have a taiga biome. There is one big problem now though, which is that the grass color doesn't match up with the color of the spruce leaves. So to fix this problem, it's time to create a biome color interpolation system. Basically what I'm going to do is that each biome will have its own unique color. So the forest is going to be bright green, but the taiga will be a more bluish green, and the desert will be more red. Then, every time a block that's color is dependent on the biome is rendered, a separate texture called an overlay will be rendered on top of the original block, and colored based on the biomes close to the block. You could see the overlay texture here, and it includes all of the leaves and other foliage that we want to be able to control the color of. If you're wondering why it's white, this is because when you color a texture, it gets multiplied by the new color. So since white is represented as 1, 1, 1, multiplying it by green will result in a green color. If this was green by default, we wouldn't be able to change its color at all. If we run the game now with the system and go to the intersection of two biomes, you could see that the colors of the greenery gradually smooth into each other. And if I go into a desert, which doesn't normally have grass, and place it down, you can see that it looks all dried out. This is super satisfying looking. Although it may not seem like it, we ended up getting a lot done in this episode, and I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment if you have any suggestions on what I should add next. Anyways, thank you guys as always for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye